Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. Episode 5 of Stalin, Nadja and Kirov. On November 8th, 1932, the Stalins were hosting a party to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the October Revolution when the Bolsheviks had come to power. As they hosted this party, the crisis in Ukraine was at its height. Beneath the glamour and the celebratory atmosphere, the political tensions ran riot. Just hours before the party, Stalin met the head of the secret police to discuss the developments in the countryside. Against the backdrop of the push for grain and collectivization, and industrialization in the first five-year plan, a very personal drama would unfold. As we've described, the Bolsheviks were an unusually close-knit community. Such was the all-consuming nature of their political careers, and the fanaticism of their devotion to revolution. Very few of them had many close associates outside of the party. Stalin's inner circle, although constantly shifting and changing, was populated entirely by party members. Many of these had been associates of Stalin from the underground days, when their party was robbing banks and constantly evading arrest by the Tsar's secret police. They had witnessed and taken part in the October Revolution, although, as we've discussed, its dramatic heft was subsequently exaggerated for propaganda. Now, they held the reins of power over a rapidly changing nation. Stalin and Nadia were the power couple at the centre of this web of connections and influence. Stalin was already occasionally referred to by the title of Vojt, or leader, although often not to his face. Yet their marriage had been strained for years, by his workaholism and callousness, and by her mental instability and desire to be more than just a housewife. Everyone could see it. Most of the Bolshevik magnates, unsympathetic, sided with Stalin, telling him that his wife was quite impossible to deal with at times. The roller coaster of the marriage, feverish declarations of love, interspersed with dramatic episodes where Nadja would declare she was leaving and taking the children with her, was surely taking its emotional toll on both of them. Nadja had dressed up unusually for the dinner party, exchanging the usual drab Bolshevik modestness for a black dress with embroidered red roses imported from Berlin. Her brother, who'd served in the armed forces, had brought it home for her in some such special occasion. Stalin didn't seem to notice. He spent the evening flirting with the wife of a Red Army commander. Apparently, his preferred method of flirtation was throwing bits of bread at the lady, an actress who was rumoured to have all kinds of affairs behind her husband's back. Perhaps when you're in charge of the Soviet superstate, the allure of power can overcome a lack of flirtatious finesse. Certainly, by all accounts, Stalin had plenty of admirers. There were even some rather dramatic pieces of fan mail that arise from the newly opened USSR archives that sound like the kind of thing your average boy band pop star has to put up with. It's also clear and understandable that this flirtation made Nadja jealous. Apparently the tipping point came when Stalin toasted the destruction of the enemies of the state at the dinner, you know, standard, cheerful, dinner time toast, and noticed that Nadja wasn't drinking. Maybe she couldn't tolerate the thought that this destruction meant mass starvation for innocent peasants. Maybe she was just personally irritated at Stalin for flirting with another woman and ignoring her. Hey you, have a drink, yelled Stalin to Nadja. My name isn't Hay. Shut up, shut up, yelled Nadja in response. She stormed out of the room, followed by the wife of a party comrade. Stalin, probably well on the way to drunkenness at this point, didn't see the point in going after her. What a fool, he said to have muttered under his breath. Given all that we know about their marriage, Nadja storming off in a huff over some slight, real or imagined, was probably a fairly regular occurrence. Stalin, determined not to let it ruin his evening, went off to an after-party and returned to his apartment in the early hours of the morning. There were rumours that during this time he had an illicit rendezvous with an unknown woman, and this was reported to Nadja by an inexperienced guard when she asked where he was. Whatever the real case may be, he didn't return home until late, and probably rolled in drunk. Without checking on his wife, he went straight to his own bed in a room on the other side of the apartment. Nadja, for her part, composed a vicious letter to Stalin, a letter that their daughter Svetlana would later describe as terrible. Her brother had brought her home an expensive lady's pistol, a fitting weapon for a revolutionary, but in hindsight a less than perfect gift for a manic depressive, prone to fits of despair. At some point in the early hours of the morning, Nadja shot herself in the heart. She was 31 years old. She died that same night. The scene here mirrors the scene after Stalin's own eventual death in 1953. When the event was discovered, the initial reaction was panic. Who was going to tell Stalin? Household servants summoned various Bolshevik magnates, doctors and professors, but it was far too late to do anything to help Nadja. Apparently, Stalin eventually walked into the room himself, presumably to see what the fracas was about. His reaction is captured by Montefiore. Quote, Stalin was poleaxed. This supremely political creature, with an inhuman disregard for the millions of starving women and children in his own country, displayed more humanity over the next few days than he would at any other time in his life. Olga, Nadja's mother, 
an elegant lady of independent spirit who had known Stalin so long and always regretted her daughter's behaviour, hurried into the dining room, where a broken Stalin was still absorbing the news. Doctors had arrived, and they offered the heartbroken mother some valerian drops, the Valium of the 1930s, but she could not drink them. Stalin staggered towards her. I'll drink them, he said, and down the whole dose. He saw the body and the letter which, his daughter wrote, shocked and wounded him grievously. The Man of Steel was a shambles, not sideways, exploding in fits of rage, blaming anyone else, even the books she was reading, before subsiding in despair. Then he claimed he resigned from power. He too was going to kill himself, saying, I can't go on living like this. End quote. Although Stalin was given to the dramatic flair when things went wrong, this level of depression was unprecedented, and he was kept under suicide watch by his associates for several days, until he calmed down and was able to resume public life. It's impossible to know what impact this tragic event had on Stalin, personally and politically. He always had shown himself to be a callous merchant of death. Perhaps all it did was further harden his resolve and bitterness. And it's very easy to fit historical figures into a narrative. This was the moment where they became the monster that we know them to be. Real people aren't like that. They don't transition that suddenly, in most cases. Yet, beyond the tragedy of a loved one's death, the suicide was a personal repudiation of Stalin. Svetlana, his daughter, wrote that he was too smart not to realise that people always commit suicide in order to punish someone. It seems that when Stalin discussed this event, he underwent the range of emotion that people often do in this circumstance. Half the time he blamed Nadja, crying, She's crippled me and abandoned the children. She left me like an enemy. On occasion, even Stalin felt that he was at fault, saying, I couldn't save you, over her funeral casket, and once, quite bizarrely in my view, admitting, I wasn't the best husband. I never had time to take her to the cinema. After 1932, so many of the Bolshevik inner circle said that Stalin changed. Whether it was the immense political pressure of the famine in the Ukraine, having so much blood on his hands, or the personal sense of guilt and betrayal at his wife's death, we cannot know. In her room, a political pamphlet written by Stalin's opponents was discovered, which has led a lot of people to speculate that Stalin took this as a political repudiation as well as a personal one. In the case of Nadja, there was evidence that her mental health problems went back for many years. Yet at the same time, I can't imagine that knowing about the famine in the Ukraine and the general stress of being the first family of Russia didn't take its toll on her. She had a state funeral where Stalin openly wept in public, something none of his associates had ever seen, and it was announced officially that she had died of appendicitis. The truth about her suicide was not even published in the Soviet Union until 1988, although Western historians knew about it much earlier. Her suicide had a terrible effect on the Stalin children, who had already been distant from both of their parents for political reasons. Svetlana, who was only six, was not informed what had happened, and a year after her death was still asking when her mother would return from abroad. The eldest son, Vasily, who had already been somewhat rough around the edges, became by many accounts a violent little princeling who was desperately unhappy, seeking the approval of his distant father and substituting his absent parenthood with the nearest father figures to hand, his bodyguards. Stalin would later, in private, regret that he had not been there for his children, in the same way as he had not been there for his wives. But it should have been clear from the start where his priorities in life really were. Stalin was not emotionally ready to give the speech at Nagy's funeral, and so this duty went to one Lazar Kaganovich. He was one of the new breed of Stalinist associates, for, although I didn't have time to talk about it too much last episode, as Stalin destroyed the NEP and made his great heel turn, at the same time he politically destroyed Bukharin and the right wing of the party thus fully consolidating his power. When, in 1928, Stalin had begun the grain requisitions, Bukharin, Rykov and Tomsky, who had later become known as the key figures of the right opposition to the Bolsheviks, were in favour of continuing with the NEP and its slower, more steady route towards industrialisation. Bukharin made his thoughts known at the Party Congress of that year, but having helped Stalin accumulate ever more power in his defeat of Trotsky, Zinoviev and Kamenev, he was out of friends and out of allies. Stalin found it easy at this stage to replace Bukharin and his allies in various party machines with other figures. Ideologically, it was also easy to attack Bukharin, as he was essentially supporting a capitalist deviation from true Marxism-Leninism. The NEP had always sat uneasily with the more radical ideologues in the party, and it was true that Lenin had only ever intended it as a temporary compromise. The tactic of divide and conquer that Stalin used was successful, and by 1929, Bukharin had been expelled from the Politburo. Meeting with Kamenev and Zinoviev, who had already been expelled and demonised as factionalists, did not allow Bukharin to rehabilitate his reputation any, 
The key here is that the last of the old Politburo members, who had taken power in the October Revolution and still had links to the legitimacy of Lenin, was now also sidelined. The last of the figures that Lenin had mentioned in his suppressed testament as possible successors had been expelled from the Politburo, and instead, Stalin would fill it with men whose loyalty could not be questioned. Bukharin apologised to Stalin publicly, worried about being expelled from the party for setting up a faction. But in private, he was stirred to Stalin as Genghis Khan, and lamented the fact that he had amassed total power over the party. Stalin knew that Bukharin's public displays of loyalty were insincere. After all, he had the private communications of all Politburo members tapped and monitored from the early stages of the power struggle in the 1920s. But Bukharin was allowed to remain in the party, and given some minor administrative roles. There was, of course, a good argument for keeping your enemies as close as possible in the USSR. So who were the new loyalists who filled Stalin's inner circle? In his wonderful book, The Court of the Red Tsar, Montefiore deals with all the individuals in the inner circle, using their own words and communications as much as possible, and shedding light on Stalin via his associations with his contemporaries. There was Molotov, nicknamed Stone Arse on account of sitting at his desk for 18 hours a day. He was a Bolshevik ideological purist, and considered something of a dull plodder by Lenin and others. One of the things you notice about the men who Stalin surrounds himself with is their fanatical devotion to ideology, but sometimes also their lack of individual creative thought about that ideology. Loyalty was a more important quality than originality for Stalin. In terms of dogged loyalty and intense bureaucracy, Molotov was second to none. Serving as Premier, during this period, he oversaw collectivisation and the implementation of the first five-year plan. He was personally in charge of the grain shipments from the Ukraine that was so instrumental in leading to the Holodomor. Later in his career, he was best remembered for being Stalin's foreign minister. After Hitler's rise to power in 1933, this was probably the key area of Soviet government, with the focus shifting abroad. In Molotov, Stalin had a competent and capable loyalist and deputy, who he often gave key roles of responsibility. There was also Kaganovich, a Politburo member who had become known as Iron Lazar. Amongst his duties were being in charge of the railways, the construction of the admittedly beautiful and grand Moscow metro, and sharing responsibility with Molotov for the implementation of Stalin's economic policies. There was Sergo Orkonikidze, a tireless fellow Georgian of Stalin's who was in charge of heavy industry. These men often had disputes with Stalin over the finer points of policy, and they were by no means complete lickspittles. They would regularly write notes to each other in very familiar and friendly terms, but none of them would be on criticising Stalin when necessary. Sergo, for example, wrote to him of his experiences in the countryside and the disastrous consequences of collectivization. Some of them even still referred to him by the familiar Koba, as if reminding him of the time when they had all been equals, when he'd just been another revolutionary. But in reality, there was little doubt that they knew where the power in the USSR really lay, and none of them ever seriously challenged his leadership. Far less questionable in terms of blind, slavish loyalty, and one of the more repugnant characters you come across, was Lavrenti Beria. No historian has anything nice to say about Beria, and with good reason. He was one of Stalin's more brutal and murderous lieutenants, so intimately associated with the secret police and the NKVD, that for a long time the excesses of Stalin's purges and repression were actually laid at Beria's feet. People were willing to believe that he was solely responsible for the mass executions that would comprise Stalin's great terror. The sickening thing about Beria is how, to Stalin's face, he was a sycophant. When he first visited Stalin's Dhaka and first caught the eye of the Bolshevik tyrant, it said that Stalin was complaining about the shoddy state of the garden. Beria immediately grabbed an axe and cut down an offending tree, saying, I'm just demonstrating to the master of the garden, Josef Vissarionovich, that I can chop down any tree that offends him. It's as if he was offering to become Stalin's enforcer agent against imagined enemies. Beneath the toadying and flattery, Beria concealed a horrific personality beneath a loyalist exterior. There is now a great deal of historical evidence that he abused his power of head of the NKVD to carry out a campaign of sexual assault against women. He would drive around the streets with fellow NKVD officers at night, selecting individuals to target. From Montefiore again. Quote, After dining, Beria would take a woman into his soundproofed office and rape them. Beria's bodyguards reported that their orders included handing each victim a flower bouquet as she left Beria's house. The implication being that to accept it made it consensual. Refusal would mean arrest. In one incident, his chief bodyguard, Sarkisov, reported that a woman had been brought to Beria and had rejected his advances and ran out of his office. Sarkisov mistakenly handed her the flowers anyway, prompting the enraged Beria to declare, Now it's not a bouquet, it's a wreath. May it rot on your grave. 
The woman was arrested by the NKVD the next day. End quote. Some women, in desperation, were persuaded to accept his advances in the hope of freeing husbands or siblings, who had been detained by the NKVD. In one case, Beria promised to free the father and grandfather of a young actress before raping her. The relatives in question had, in reality, been executed months earlier. Beria's many crimes are still under investigation, with the handwritten list that he kept of his victims due for public release in 2028. There was strong anecdotal evidence that Stalin and other Politburo members knew about Beria's actions, with Stalin even telephoning his daughter when she was left alone with Beria and telling her to leave immediately. Other Politburo members advised their daughters never to accept a lift from him. Such is the nature of the type of individual who can rise to great prominence and influence when loyalty and brutality are the main qualities that the leader searches for. As Stalin's regime became more and more bloodthirsty, Beria would rise to greater and greater prominence. In 1932, after Naja's death, however, one of the greatest stars of the Bolshevik party, rising through the ranks, was Sergei Kirov, who was in charge of the Leningrad, that is, St. Petersburg or Petrograd, renamed after Lenin in the Soviet Union, branch of the party. Stalin had promoted him to this position in 1926, when Zinoviev had been ousted from the Leningrad party, where his power had been concentrated. The geographical separation of Russia, and the concentration of the urban, educated population in a few industrial centres, meant that being a local party boss was often a key stepping stone in your political career. While Kirov was in Leningrad, he could build up a network of contacts and influence, independent of the central bureaucracy. Leningrad had been the old capital of the state, after all, and it was a very influential city. Kirov was a dashing young man who enjoyed drinking and the good life, and he later became a very close friend of Stalin's. Montefiore puts it wonderfully. He says, quote, Stalin turned to Kirov, who he said cared for me like a child. Kirov was at ease in his own skin. It was perhaps this that made him so attractive to Stalin, whose friendships resembled crushes, and like crushes they could turn swiftly into bitter envy. Now he wanted to be with Kirov all the time. Kirov was in and out of his office five times during the days after Naji's funeral. Stalin and Kirov were like a pair of equal brothers, teasing one another, telling dirty stories, laughing. Big friends, brothers, and they needed one another, according to Stalin's adopted son. With his new circle of loyalist associates, and still recovering from the personal tragedy of Naji's death, perhaps Stalin wanted to throw himself into political matters more. In 1933, a rip-roaring speech declaring the successes of collectivization and the first five-year plan was delivered to a leading of key Bolsheviks. And Stalin could indeed point to a lot of achievements, although many of them were exaggerated and achieved at a terrible cost. The Baltic White Sea Canal had been completed in just a few years and spanned over 200 miles, but it had required the slave labour of nearly 200,000 political prisoners, of whom more than 10% had died in the process. The terrible famine that was still occurring in the Ukraine was of course not mentioned. Yet beneath the propaganda, bombast and bluster of the endlessly overfulfilled quotas and an economic miracle, there were rumblings of discontent in the Stalinist regime. On the eve of the 17th Party Congress, when the state newspaper Pravda was reporting, quote, Stalin, the appearance of the ardently loved Vojt leader, whose name is inseparably linked with all the victories scored by the proletariat by the Soviet Union, was greeted with tumultuous ovations, end quote. While this was still being reported in Pravda, there were secret meetings going on between various local party leaders. The strain and horror of Stalin's brutality, along with the kind of personal grievances that always accrue in a system full of ambitious people, led to a conspiracy. Kirov was approached and sounded out by a group of regional party leaders, and was asked if he would consider replacing Stalin in the leadership one day. There's a classic story in Roman history of the self-fulfilling prophecy. The prefect Macrinus... One of his duties was to read the Emperor Caracalla's post, and one day he received a letter concerning a prophecy. The prophecy stated that Caracalla would be overthrown, and he, Macrinus, would be the next emperor. Now, what could Macrinus do? If Caracalla discovered the prop prophecy, Macrinus would surely be killed, even if he dutifully reported it to the emperor. In the end, Macrinus did the only thing he felt he could, and, to defend himself, launched a coup against Caracalla. The prophecy came true. Ever the loyalist, and perhaps understanding like Macrinus did the terrible consequences of suspicion, Kirov immediately reported this plot to Stalin, who thanked him and sent him on his way. But the seeds of doubt had already been sown, and they were quite clearly made worse during the party congress votes. 
Now, every time the party met, there was a formal vote to elect members of the Central Committee. The system that it used was quite arcane, so what happened was a list of candidates got nominated, and the delegates crossed out the names that they didn't approve of. So it's a sort of negative voting, and it turned out to have quite a dramatic effect. Kirov received two or three negative votes, while Stalin got well over a hundred. Of course, this election was meaningless and the results were repressed. Remember Stalin's quote about how the really important thing was not who voted, but who counted the ballots. All of the negative ballots for Stalin were destroyed. When the results were announced, Stalin pointedly was declared to be one vote more popular than Kirov. Stalin initially planned to separate Kirov from his power base by summoning him from Leningrad to a more central role in the party, so that Stalin could keep an eye on him and potentially head off conspiracies from outside his government. But Kirov managed to negotiate a compromise where he stayed in Leningrad while taking on some new responsibilities. This did nothing to assuage the newfound tension in their relationship. Montefiore points out that on June 30th, 1933, while all this was going on, Hitler's Night of the Long Knives occurred when he dramatically disposed of his own internal party rivals through a sudden series of arrests. Stalin himself commented, Some fellow that Hitler! Splendid! That's a deed of some skill! Over the next few months, Stalin and Kirov had an oscillating relationship. Sometimes there would be a détente, and the two would laugh and joke in the way that we'd described before. But sometimes they'd fall out over some political matter, like Kirov's opposition to Stalin, when he wanted to end bread rationing, which was necessary to feed Leningrad. When Kirov and Beria visited the city of Baku together, Kirov fell mysteriously ill, and doctors were baffled by his symptoms, which ended up being very severe. He even suffered a heart attack. Beria, who would end up with quite the track record as a poisoner, has not escaped this incident free of suspicion. But a few weeks later, Kirov and Stalin were once again embracing in the private carriage of his train. It was not in Stalin's nature to telegraph his political actions ahead of time. I'll go back to Montefiore for the description of what happened next. Quote, On 1st December, Kirov started at work at home and set off from his apartment on foot to the office. He entered the Smolny Institute by the public entrance. At 4.30pm, Kirov, followed by his bodyguard Borisov, walked up to his third floor office. Old Borisov fell behind, either from being unfit or from being strangely delayed by some policeman from Moscow. Kirov turned right and passed a dark-haired young man, Leonid Nikolaev, who pressed him against the wall to allow Kirov to pass, and then trailed along behind him. Nikolaev pulled out a revolver and shot Kirov from three feet away in the back of the neck. He then turned the pistol on himself and squeezed the trigger, but an electrician working nearby somehow knocked him down and the second bullet hit the ceiling. Boris of the guard staggered up breathlessly, and Kirov fell face down, head turned to the right, his cap's peak resting on the floor, and still gripping his briefcase. A Bolshevik workaholic to the last. End quote. It is often wise to be wary of pointing to specific turning points in history. So often, for the sake of narrative convenience, we miss out on the subtleties of wider trends and forces, so that we can tell a more dramatic story. It seems inevitable to me that Stalin's paranoia would eventually have forced him to start turning on his rivals and enemies within the party. Bolshevism was obsessed with the elimination of these internal rivals. But the murder of Kirov was a turning point in Stalin's regime in two key ways. First, it was really one of the first times that violence and murder had been used against a former ally and friend in order to head off a potential coup attempt. Remember that previous old Bolsheviks had been demoted and exiled rather than killed. And second, it gave Stalin the excuse he needed to organise a wider purge. As soon as Stalin was informed of the murder, he announced that Kirov had been assassinated and that it was the left opposition of Zinoviev, Kamenev and Trotsky who were responsible for the murder. The reality of the situation and of ultimate responsibility is less clear. Nikolaev was a malcontent, likely blaming Kirov for his own lack of political success. He was unemployed, he was in debt, and there were strong suspicions that Kirov, who was no stranger to womanising, was having an affair with his wife. He visited Kirov's office a few weeks before armed with a pistol, in violation of the law, but the NKVD secret police mysteriously released him, and their security around Kirov was very lax for a man who was so important. Did Stalin order the murder, or did he simply instruct the NKVD to allow it to happen, or was he firmly blameless and just exploited it for his own political ends? In this, I lean towards the conspiracy theory angle. There are so many incredibly suspicious aspects to this case. Borisov the bodyguard was arrested, and mysteriously died in a car accident the day afterwards before he could give evidence. The rate of car accidents amongst informants and other suspects was staggeringly high, 
Maybe the NKVD needed to invest in better drivers? The assassin, Nikolaev, was personally questioned by Stalin, who declared that this proved he was working with the left opposition. Mysterious accidents were suffered by policemen who'd spoken to the assassin. His wife, who had supposedly been the one having an affair with Kirov, was arrested and executed before she could testify. We'll never know for certain. There's no smoking gun piece of evidence that proves Stalin was responsible. The muddy circumstances could be down to incompetent secret policemen trying to cover their own tracks. After all, Stalin also ordered that some of the police should be arrested for mishandling the case and allowing Kirov to be assassinated, although none of these sentences were actually carried out. Stalin may not have directly ordered the murder, but as every historian notes, he certainly profited greatly from it. If the wild conspiracy theory that this murder was a genuine assassination was true, his wrath should have fallen on the assassin and the local police forces who failed in protecting Kirov. Instead, the wild conspiracy theory that Trotsky, Zinoviev and Kamenev were responsible was the focus of Stalin's investigation and public announcements. Never let it be said that the dull bureaucrat had no flair for the dramatic, and of course, the more you paint the picture of internal enemies and sabotage as opposed to incompetence, the more of your rivals you can dispose of. Under torture, Nikolaev admitted a link to Zinoviev. Zinoviev and Kamenev were arrested and sentenced to five and ten year sentences, and some 6,000 people found guilty of some sort of complicity in the plot were arrested and executed in the month of December alone. At the same time, one man, Nikolai Yezov, was rising through the ranks of the secret police. Various different descriptions of him exist. It seems that he had an outwardly modest and shy appearance, although there's one denunciation of him that was written in 1936 by an old Bolshevik, who said, quote, In the whole of my long life, I have never met a more repellent personality than Yezov's. When I look at him, I'm reminded irresistibly of the wicked urchins of the courts in Rastarevyeva Street, whose favourite occupation was to tie a piece of paper dipped in kerosene to a cat's tail, set fire to it, and then watch with delight how the terrified animal would tear down the street, trying desperately but in vain to escape the approaching flames. I do not doubt that in his childhood, Yezov amused himself in just such a manner, and that he's now continuing to do so in different forms. End quote. Yezov would later become known as the Poison Dwarf, owing to the fact he was five feet tall. Stalin liked him because he reliably followed through on any order that was given to him, without delay, hesitation, or questioning. Ideal for a secret police chief. Montefiore describes him as, quote, uneducated but sly, able, perceptive, and without any moral boundaries. He worked with the current head of the NKVD, Yagoda, in the attempts to squeeze confessions of counter-revolutionary crimes out of Zinoviev and Kamenev while they were under arrest, and organised a miniature purge of some elements in the Kremlin that Stalin had grown hostile to. The level of his eventual involvement in the Great Terror was such that it was sometimes called the Yezovshina, although this term was probably invented by Stalin in an attempt to pin the blame on Yezov. Even as repression expanded, the cult of personality around Stalin, and even some members of his Bolshevik inner circle, intensified. Stalin played up to this. In some ways, he viewed himself as a red czar. He described Ivan the Terrible, the old czar, as his teacher in all things, and voraciously read about him. It's notable that Ivan the Terrible was at a constant war with his underling lords known as boyars, and frequently had them purged and executed for disloyalty. You get the sense that maybe, if you were one of Stalin's inner circle... The fact that he idolised a man famous for torturing and executing his own allies for disloyalty might cause a slight sense of alarm. Stalin said that the Russian people, they needed a Tsar whom they could worship, live and work for. And he was not averse to occasional actions that showed he had the common touch. When an elderly grandmother wrote to him offering a cow, a bizarre sort of tribute to the new lord, he wrote back in a kind tone, saying that he didn't have much room for one in his office, but thanking her for his, her offer. He intervened on behalf of a schoolteacher who complained that he'd been unfairly dismissed. He rode the new Moscow metro against the advice of his advisers, and caused a considerable stir when he did so. Pravda even attempted to publish an interview with his mother, although this was a little too tabloidy for Stalin. Besides, the distant and austere remove of a great leader probably precludes speaking to his mother about what he was like when he was a child. There's a telling conversation around this time between Stalin and his mother that's often reported by historians. The ageing Keke asked, Son, where are you now exactly? Stalin, Well, remember the Tsars? I suppose I'm a bit like a Tsar. Oh, 
You would have been better if you became a priest, replied his mother. Stalin apparently just laughed in response. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've enjoyed Autocracy Now, please leave us a review or rate us on iTunes. I know everyone always says this, but it's the best way to get us noticed, without me having to organise a series of increasingly dangerous publicity stunts. You can visit our website at www.autocracynow.libsyn.com Email the show at autocracynowoutlook.com Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, WordPress, and donate to the show if you like. Tell your friends, tell your enemies. Next episode, we will deal with the Great Terror. The systematic repression that had been rumbling in the background throughout the Stalinist regime will take on new and terrifying proportions, and turn inwards on members of the party itself. Paranoia, mass violence, torture, and vast list of victims drawn up and signed off in Politburo offices. The same intensity, brutality, and target-based mentality that had driven the Soviet industrialization under the first five-year plan would now be deployed in a different kind of machinery that would systematically destroy the lives of millions of people and sever the last links between the revolution of Lenin and the autocracy of Stalin. <laughs>